Hello, and welcome to Navigating the French, the podcast where each episode we look at a French word and try and see what it tells us about French culture. I'm your host, Emily Monaco. Today, I'm chatting with Anne Marcella, an author, jazz musician, and founder of Madame du Châtelet Productions, a literary salon in Paris celebrating the feminine erotic. She's here to discuss a word linked to the French passions of flirtation and seduction, coquette. Hi, Anne. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you, Emily. Pleased to be here. Can you tell me a little bit about what brought you to Paris and what sort of work you're doing here now? I came here as a graduate student way back uh, in 89. Uh, I came to study with um, a French feminist and writer named Hélène Sixus. I was I had read one of her seminal works back in college called uh, The Laugh of the Medusa. And then I found, I realized that I could actually study in Paris with her directly. And it was free of cost. It was, well, basically, I mean, it was like $100, $100 about that equivalent back at the time at the University of Paris 8. And uh, that brought me over. I wanted to, There's there was that, that was the ostensible reason. But more, the deeper reason was I really profoundly wanted to learn and integrate the French culture. I always, um, I'd always dreamed of, I think, living in Europe. I never really found that where I grew up was really my place. I'm from Fresno, California, and and I have uh, European ancestry very close, not, not from France, more Spain and Italy, but I uh, started studying French in college and loved it and came for a junior year abroad and then in a second year as an assistant in Marseille and and then I was just sold. I, I knew that I wanted to spend a good part of my life here. And I've been here ever since. It's been over, over 30 years, I'm afraid. Amazing. And you have obviously integrated the French culture quite, uh, um, oh gosh, I don't even know, fully, wholly. And you've become an expert in an element of the French culture that I think fascinates a lot of us Americans and a lot of foreigners, which is short, sort of this obsession, this interest, this importance of things like pleasure and flirtation and beauty. And um, and you're here today to talk about a word that we use sometimes in English, we borrow into it, but I think that it means there's a depth of it that we haven't really understood as Americans. And that word, of course, is coquette. So when I was researching this term uh, before we ha started our conversation, I found that the etymology of coquettes, which I'm sure is no surprise to you, is linked to coq, C-O-Q, which is the rooster, a symbol of France. And do you think that just at its outset, there is something innately French about coquettishness? Uh, I do. I do. I think, you know, any word that, that derives from a particular language and then that travels to other languages and keeps its shape says something that's intrinsically true about that culture. And I, I think that France is hold seduction as a, as a, one of the prime cultural values. And, and it's almost, um, it's almost so ubiquitous as to be invisible. I mean, it's, I don't think they, they consciously think much about it. It's just their way of being in the world. We see it as, you know, because it's quite different from our way of being. Uh, and I'm talking about North America and particularly the United States, where we're from, where probably our cultural value would be money, you know, making money, success. And, and how aware of that are we, you know, <laughs> in a way. So they, it's, it's a way of, yeah, I would say it's a way of, of living and breathing, actually. And the word coquette, it's interesting. Yeah, it does come from cook. And then the female version is different. You know, it's, it's uh, for one thing, it's an old fashioned word. It's not a word that is used much anymore. And it has, it, it harkens back to the 19th century. There's even a Blanche du Bois kind of uh, side to it, where it's, if it's used, it's, it tends to be used maybe more for older women. That's the way I see it. And there's also interesting, there's a, there's a, a coquette could also be like the, the mistress of a bourgeois gentleman. That's in the past. And I looked it up. I have a 1964 Oxford Dictionary, which is a brilliant resource for seeing how, investigating how misogynistic language is. And it <laughs> says, and I'll, I'll give you an example of that. There's a really funny one. But it, the, the definition that my 1964 Oxford Dictionary, and, it, and it's, it's funny because it's 19, 1964 is my birth date. And I found this dictionary at the flea market uh, in Montreuil. And I found actually two of them over the years. And they're both 1964. So it's kind of funny. So it says a woman who trifles with a man's affections. So there we have it's a woman who's actually manipulating a man. She trifles. And the idea of trifle is very pejorative. And this mm -hmm. is this is the, you know, English, British um, dictionary. 
And to give you an example um, of how far they go in the Oxford Dictionary, 1964, uh, clitoris is just defined as a rudimentary female sexual organ. Okay. And then you look at rudimentary, wow. means organ imperfectly developed is having no function. <laughs> So there you have it. That's what we're dealing with. So often when things go into the feminine, they're <laughs> slightly disregarded. Um, and so I think the coquette carries, it's, there's a sense of frivolent, uh, frivolity. And I was thinking of the dandy. That might be the male equivalent, the dandy. Mm. But the dandy is a flirtatious male, very slightly affected, mannered, who's, I see the dandy as being more mobile, kind of like a flaneur, somebody who uh, gets around, goes to salon, from salon to salon. I see the coquette is more a female who is trying to attract the male gaze uh, through her accoutrements and her her makeup and her fashion uh, savvy. And and it's so interesting what you said about that being the definition that's in the Oxford English Dictionary, because obviously you and I come from North America, which like the UK tends to be a far more puritanical society than France does with, as you mentioned, this sort of constant seduction and this dance of seduction throughout the culture. And so I'm wondering if you think a French person would have that negative connotation when they call someone or when they think of someone as being coquette or coquettish. I think there might be a slight bit of, I think the word coquette, which we're, that's where we're starting. I think, I think that for one, it's not used very often. But the idea of a woman who is flirtatious, uh, I don't think it's seen pejoratively really at all. And I, I just, some thing, some uh, regarding flirtatiousness and seduction, I think that in France, it's, um, it's a way that a woman expresses her individuality, you know, her, her, her singularity. You know, every woman has to find her way into the seduction. And there's no, it's not a codified thing. I think that maybe, you know, coming from the United States, we have the images we have from films and whatnot, seduction, it's always sort of the same thing. Or we have, you know, it's the idea that you, you know, you put on your lingerie and, you know, for the date. And, and I think that the, you know, that kind of lingerie that a North American might reserve for that night, I think, you know, the French women just, that's what they put on pretty much every day. And I was always surprised I would, when I was studying, I was, you know, I've done a lot of dance over the years and been in locker rooms and in French dance studios. And I also practiced Qigong for a long time. And I was always kind of amazed at when women would take, change their clothes to, just to see what they're wearing underneath. And they were really beautiful lingerie just on a, on an every day kind of day, you know, work day. And uh, so it's a way of just, it's, it's a way of inhabiting your body and, and it's not to show off it's, it's a particular relationship with oneself. And I think that, um, and you see, and also in, in a lot, well, of course, seduction, you see it in, in all over French cinema, isn't it? It's just everywhere. And, and you'll see that every, every actress has her particular charm, her particular way. And, it, and it, it, it's an expression of her personality and of her uniqueness. I like, I like thinking of it that way. The game is to find, to sort of... Uh, this is going to sound a bit corny, but I'm thinking of like a flower and the different petals and going, you know, it's like petal by petal, finding the woman, you know, her, her uniqueness, her, her particular scent. And I think there's a game like that that's played, which is interesting because, uh, I, yeah, I, I, I just don't think we look at it that way in the, in the U.S. And I, I left the United States very young. I left the United States at 23. So, you know, I missed a lot of things. I missed a lot. But as I, as I, you know, I'm still, I'm still very much American and I return often and I just don't, I don't see that kind of investigation, that kind of play um, between men and women there. It's different. It's a, there's obviously there's always a dance. Of course. No. And I think you've, you've said so many things that, that I want to go back to. So first off, you were talking about this, the, the lingerie and the fact that these women in France tend to take pride in, in their appearance. And it is something as simple as, you know, I, I remember when I first started going to the gym here, like I would see these older women changing near me, like in full matching sets of like beautiful plum colored, <laughs> like lacy lingerie. And, and you get this feeling they're really just doing it for themselves. Like that was what they were wearing yes. under their clothes to come to the gym. And I do yeah. feel like that there is, and maybe it's changing a little bit with generations, but I don't think it's changing that much. 
I think that when we think about what is a sought after kind of trait in an American woman, like we look at, you look at the media and you see like girl next door, not like other girls. And there's this sort of desire for your attraction to be effortless, for it to be something that's innate that you don't have to work at. And that's what makes it appealing. Whereas in France, and I think we see this A, among the French, but also in our outward perceptions of the French when we position ourselves as like Americans making movies about the French, I mean, or thinking of Emily in Paris as well, we see the French and the French women as being women who do take care with their appearance and who do put in the effort. And like, it's very rare in France, for example, to see a woman going around in athleisure. You don't see that here. No, no. So there is that effort almost, which I think as Americans, we perceive as a negative. But in France, do you think that like putting effort into your appearance and effort into the way that you walk through the world and effort into the seduction, is that seen as a positive or a negative or neutral, just sort of something that happens? Oh, I think it's everything. I think it's seen as very positive. And I think it's, it's, it's almost, uh, it's given, you know, a woman who doesn't do that is seen as, as, you know, slovenly. She doesn't take care of herself. She doesn't have self-respect. You know, we see, we see it as a, you know, as such a, and I'm, I'm, you know, I'm a, a feminist, and it's interesting because when I, I came here to study French feminism, and it's very different, it's a very different take. And I, in some ways, I think the French feminists have done much better than we have. You know, in terms of they've been, they've managed to get maternity leaves, childcare, the crèche, and a lot of sort of gains that we have not had in the United States, at least. And they, you know, when I would, I remember going to the Journée de la Femme. This is like back in nineteen. 19- 90, 91, with a group of British and Australian feminists, we went to this big assembly at the Sorbonne for Women's Day. And we were, they, I mean, I, I, I just thought it was funny, but the British women were really up in arms by the fact that, or, or not up in arms, but surprised, you know, by the fact that we were greeted by young women in little red miniskirts and little hats. And you know, this is a feminist assembly and they're all very, very pretty and chic and and in minis and 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 it was just so funny because you would not see that you would not see that a feminist assembly in in London or New York would not would not ha- take that shape and there's there's they don't see any contradiction in it you know because being being female is also being being gifted with a kind of beauty and and that beauty is uh fun it's it's part of our aliveness it's part of who we are and uh so it's it's a different it's a different um way of seeing how it is to be a woman. And I think, yes, the, the effort, um, this is my own personal opinion, but, you know, there is a lot of, and it's true that the cosmetics industry and, and uh, a lot of, lot of the what is it, cosmetic surgery and this sort of thing is it, it's preying on women's insecurities. There's no doubt about that. But I also like to think that culturally throughout the world, you know, people have always, men and women, you know, in different cultures have always painted their faces and dressed up. And ha- I mean, it's all part of a human celebration. And I, I think maybe that, um, I mean, personally, I, I growing up in high school, I, I was in love with a guy who wore mascara, you know, it was kind of the punk era. And I thought that was so cool. <laughs> so I don't see why. I mean, that's another discussion, but a very different one, actually. But I, I just, I, I think that it's the idea of uh, adorning yourself as a celebration of who you are. We'll be right back with Navigating the French after a word from our sponsors. And now back to navigating the French. And and this brings me to, and maybe this is um, a related topic, my own work on my literary salon, my art salon, Salon Madame de Châtelet. And I, Madame de Châtelet was an 18th century, I guess she could be called an astrophysicist. Some people call her a mathematician. She was uh, a brilliant, in any case, brilliant in studying sciences and mathematics. And she translated Newton into French not only translated him, she wrote extensive notes explaining him because he was really re- he was very much rejected by the science of the Académie des Sciences in in France. So she brought Newton. It's still the definitive translation of him, and she went on to write different scientific papers that today they're thinking that she was on to black holes. She was on to something. She was doing really interesting investigations. And anyways, what I want to say about her is that. Here she is, this great mind, and she was also a lady very much of the senses, very much of the body, and was a, truly a coquette, truly a coquette in the, in the old-fashioned sense. She would go to court. She was a great gambler. She was very quick 
with numbers in her head, she could calculate just you know, rapid speed. And she uh, wore these dresses and she put all kinds of, you know, pom poms on them. She had all these extra things sewn onto them, little pearls and doodads. And, and, uh, and then she wore her dresses as it was the fashion at a certain time at court below the bodice would go below the nipple. So, and she, she started the fashion of rouging nipples. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, she was really a great spirit. And she had many lovers. She has had a voracious sexual appetite. And so I love her because she's very much this, this heady, great mind. You know, she had her head in the cosmos before any, you know, she was Voltaire's lover. And he was very much concerned, of course, with the march of time and, you know, preparing the revolution. He didn't know that was happening, but he was working on that. And she was not there. She was somewhere else. She's out, out in space. And at the same time, completely embodied, completely sensual, um, sang opera. Anyways, I love that. I love, I love anything. I love the way the, you know, breaking down these dichotomies of, you know, women should be this or that, you know, either she's an intellectual or she's a sensualist. No, um, you know, and, and again, another French woman, Simone de Beauvoir, have you seen the fabulous photos of her? Uh, there's a wonderful photo of her naked um, in a bathroom. You see her backside and she's got a fantastic ass. I mean, she's just so strong and so beautiful. And, you know, we have this this idea of her as being very dour, bourgeois, intellectual, and and that's not who she was at all. So, you know, I think in France, we're more open to this, the fullness of, of the female, of women. Yeah, abso- it definitely feels like it's a proto version of this subversion that I'm seeing in American media right now, which is, of course, this fact that, like you said, like, it seems like up until very, very recently, and it's still continuing now, women and, you know, in the media and therefore women absorbing this media feel they have to do the same. They have to choose between being feminine, paying attention to their looks, or being smart. It's that whole smart versus pretty dichotomy. You can't be both. You have to pick one. And it seems as though the French, with Madame de Châtelet in mind, they never really forced you to pick one. You could be both. You could always be both. Yeah, I think I think that, and that has to do with the fact that there have always been great, you know, and, and we're talking about the upper classes here too. If we go back to the 18th course. century, right? So these are women who are who are somewhat educated and who have a certain amount of clout and power. And they, they yes, they they could be. They cultivated esprit, you know, uh, repartee, and and you know they were well read, and they could speak on a lot of many subjects, and and yet they were also yes, very much, very much coquettes, very much um, wore beautiful clothing, and you know the hair, the you know the crazy hair and wigs and whatnot that they were wearing at the time. I mean, it was very, very all very extravagant. And so, no, there was no, well, I'm not going to say there, of course, there's always been misogyny and women have been discriminated against, but even so, of course, <laughs> but even so, you know, I think that, I think the one place where women, it's really interesting. I mean, it's very, it's almost hard to talk about, but in a way, the, the, it's the seduction is a sphere where a woman establishes her singularity and she, if she plays it well. In the, in the incredibly difficult man-woman game, you know, where men have the real social capital, the, the clout and the power, they can escape that kind of submission. They, they can somehow maintain their autonomy to a certain extent. Uh, and I'm talking about particularly um, in the past. And I think even to this day, I was thinking of the film, I think it was a Dieu Crie à la Femme with Brigitte Bardot and that, mm-hmm. that incredible scene where she's dancing on the tables. And it's like, She's like a wild animal. She's like a wild animal. And it's so powerful and so angry in a way and so freeing. And, and yet she's still, at the same time, she's being filmed by the male gaze. You know, it's, it's, a, you know, it's a, a man filming her. And, and it's like she's breaking out of the strictures at the same time. At the same time, it's so fascinating to me. And I don't think there's ever been a scene in American cinema like that. I don't see many instances of women really being given their full freedom on the camera. It always comes out as staged. It always comes out as, you know, Beyonce kind of everything's pre-rehearsed and perfected. And, and this is not perfected. This is, this is just, you know, like her soul in speaking through her body. And I love that. And I love that. And I always think that, I think that French film, for example, the way it films 
but men and women both, you know, just the whole relationship, the, the ease around the body, the ease around nudity. We, I came here back in the day when it was the monokini, you know, and um, it's not so much the thing anymore, but women were all, all, all topless on the beaches and, and it was just natural. It was just normal, you know, and, uh, and that just could never happen in North America. Yeah. I mean, I often hear people say, people sort of drawing the comparison of just how much casual nudity there is in in French television or film or even, you know, yogurt commercials. And in America, we have casual violence on television. So I think it's that exactly what's normalized to you here. The I mean, I'm not saying that there's no, uh, I know that you have a son. I'm not saying there's no like seven-year-old boys who aren't looking at the yogurt commercial going like, oh my God, it's boobs. But I think there's something less forbidden about it in France. There's something a little more normal about it. And so it becomes something that we don't keep a secret from people, maybe? Yes, yes. Yeah, and I'm always surprised when I go back home. Um, <laughs> just how, uh, you know, I was, I was raised Roman Catholic, and, and of course, I, well, I've, I've evolved in different ways, but just going back into the family and seeing how, how puritanical um, my family still is in some ways, you know, and, and going back to what you were saying about Brigitte Bardot, I think one thing that's so interesting about that scene in particular and what you were saying about not being able to see a scene like that in American cinema is that when we do allow women on screen in America to be animalistic, it's often to express pain. Whereas that scene, I mean, and, and the way that we perceive women on screen in France, not always, but in a lot of contexts, we allow them to have that pure, unbridled, animalistic joy. Like it's just... It's that positive side. Yes. Right? It, it, exactly. It's sort of like um, the energy that comes through in that dance reminds me of why I was walking in the Pyrenees in the mountains and I came across these wild horses, these colts, and, and this way they moved. And that was, it was Bridget Bardot on the tables, you know, just completely unbridled and wild and free. There's something, it's always, the, the female is always very contained. You know, the woman is always very contained. Now, in France, when we have this, this idea of, you know, we've been talking about women being in control of the perception that people have of them and, and cultivating sort of this, this image or this allure um, in seduction, in this modern dance of drag or flirtation in France, and I'm not saying drag for our um, Anglophone listeners, D-R-A-G, I'm saying drag, which is D-R-A-G-U-E, and it's this sort of French flirtation it seems to me that, and I know that you've done a lot more work on this than I have, but that French women tend to use, they tend to rely on the word non a lot. They sort of try and seem disinterested. You see so many movies that are framing this for an American viewer as like, oh, the French me say no when they mean yes. First of all, does this seem accurate to you? And then secondly, when we have these modern conceptions of consent, does that element of French flirtation still have a role in a modern society? Oh, wow. That's a big question, isn't it? Because I've been, I've been uh, very involved in the teaching consent, you know, in the, in the Col d'Ecole where I work, and very concerned with that, very concerned with the safety of women, particularly in heterosexuality. And yeah, yeah so, so I think traditionally, yes, you know, the, the, you know, the no is kind of elastic in French, and, and women play with that. It is, it is part of the game, undoubtedly. It's up to the man to be able to read the no. Now, the no gets very blurred, of course, when there's alcohol involved and, or substances, and then we're not really playing that. It, the, the game has to, be, has to have a certain level of awareness, uh, requires that. So it's a really tricky, tricky spot. And I think that there's a, clearly a no that's a no, I'm talking about in France, you know, in this game where we're going to talk about the... Of course, because you said the no is elastic and the no is elastic not just... In, in France, the no is elastic not just in flirtation. The no is elastic everywhere. The no is elastic if you walk into a tax office and you're like, hello, sir, I would like this form. They might say no to you first and it's up to you <laughs> yes. to get the yes. So it's not just in a do you want to go home with me situation. It's in a like, I would like to fill out tax form B66. No. So the no is this omnipresent. Yeah, so that's a really good point. Oh, God, Emily, absolutely, absolutely. That, that was the most sh shocking thing for me when I came, first came to France as a study abroad student was hearing the no. 
I didn't know how mm-hmm. to respond. And and it was it was at some kind of, you know, administrative office. I can't remember what it was. I was applying. I think probably it was I was applying for my Carte de Séjour and I and I got a no and I I just didn't even know how to deal with it because you don't get a no like that. You that firm no. And it's a no, right? It's a no that it's a starting point. The starting point in France is always a no. So when you understand that, it ha- takes on different uh, shades of meaning. So, you know, we in a, in the United States or North America, we don't we rarely say no. We rarely say no. We're always trying to, you know, we always try to find a way to accommodate or to find a possibility of a space of entente. And even if, and the yes might be very misleading, in fact. But in France, it starts with a no. And then you have to start negotiating. Exactly. So it's true that, yeah. And so it's true that, it, that this also carries forward in, um, in seduction. You know, the woman says no first and the man's used to that and then he has to work on it. You know, I want to see you work. <laughs> Get to work. Right. <laughs> right. Whereas like the difference, I mean, I know it's a little different today with everybody being on the apps, but I remember being in the States and you're standing, you're at a bar and, you know, a guy comes up to you, usually flanked by a couple of friends because American guys never approach you alone. And they're like, hey, you know, can I buy you a drink? And you're like, oh, you know, I'm here with my friends. And he's like, okay, no problem. And sort of disappears with his like tail between his legs. Yeah. Whereas in France, if you say, oh, you know, I'm here with my friends, that's an opening. That's, that's an like, opening. Yeah. well, can I buy drinks for you and your friends then? Like, that's like, yeah. how can I catapult? Oh, yeah. It would not stop there. <laughs> Absolutely. It would not stop there. If any response that you're going to give a man will, will, will encourage him to respond, you know, and, and it's, uh, yeah, it's just the beginning of the game. It's the beginning right. of the game. So it's very, it's very different. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. So then with your, with your work and consent, sort of how, how would you say that you, that you can close that door if you want to? Ah, uh, well, what I try to, what I tried to, the problem is, uh, is alcohol and, and drugs and whatnot at the parties. I see, I work, I've been working at the Gonzé Club, which are the, the very high level schools in, you know, business and engineering and whatnot. And there's a lot of partying and drinking and there's a lot of bad stuff that goes down. And I was, becoming more and more aware of it. So, you know, I had them talk about it. And one of the things is that it, when, when, you know, alcohol is just, um, it, the, the, it just kind of um, annuls the game, you know, in a way when they get that inebriated, that it's, it's just not a time to, you can't, you don't try to get a drunk girl into your bed. You know, you just don't do it. And we just, we talked about things like that. So, um, I, it was it was more at that level, and these are kids. You know, this is a generation that is being influenced by the sex positive movement. That is being influenced by a lot of ideas coming from the United States regarding consent, Me Too, and so it's interesting. I had them read the story, the Catwoman, that was in the New Yorker. That yes, you know, yeah, right, a very powerful story, and they it was really interesting. Some of them took to it, and there was but there's a lot of criticism. Criticism, and interestingly, the criticism was that it wasn't literary, that they didn't like stories like that. Yeah, yeah. I, I think I think society's evolving. I don't. It's hard for me to, you know, I have the, these kids. They're twenty, twenty-one. I have them in class. Don't really see them. I have. A, I also have a son who's eighteen. Interestingly, oh, another thing about the French is that they tend to couple. Like the couple is really important, and so young. You know, it's not like. I remember in high school that it was so, it was pretty nasty, a nasty scene. It was like the guys are trying to get things from the girls and, uh, you know, I went to a Catholic high school. It was just ridiculous. And I just didn't want anything to do with it because I thought it was just all pathetic. And here it's, it's not like that. You know, my son has had a girlfriend since he's 14. Yeah. They couple young and they couple fast. <laughs> and they couple fast. And it's very, but it's, yeah, exactly. They couple fast. Yeah. And you see that yeah. a lot with the dating apps one. And then, you know, it's crash and burn a lot of times, but. Yeah. But there's none of that like, oh, you know, like it's six months in, we're still getting to know each other. It's like, no, oh, God, like no. I, I like you. We've kissed <laughs> here. Meet my mom. Like, exactly. <laughs> yeah. We're a couple oh. now. <laughs> yep. Yeah. yeah. It's very different. Yeah. It's very different. Which is so funny because considering the the image that we have of the French from the outside, we always think of them as these like lady killers when really they they really do like to be coupled. They do. Yeah. They absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. We'll be right back with Navigating the French after a word from our sponsors. And now back to Navigating the French. 
So I know you said that coquette is not a word that's that's used that often today, but if you could think of one characteristic of the coquettes of yore that you think is still probably the most pervasive in the French seduction game today, what do you think it would be? Uh, I would think it is, I see it as a mannered way of being, mm. very precious, a kind of preciousness. I quite like the word personally. I like the word and I like the idea of a woman who who plays with uh, maybe like Emily de Chatelet, for example, she'd over, it was, there's a, there's something that's a little bit overdone just slightly with a coquette. There's just a little bit of extra something that she, a little spin that she puts on her ward, on her clothing or on her, her way of, her way of responding or calling attention to herself that I find interesting. And I, I've known a few coquettes, you know, um, I've met, and usually I see, I see a coquette as slightly older woman. Well, I have just one more question for you before you leave us, and that is, Anne, what is your favorite word in French? Oh, it used to be boudoir Ooh. Uh, <laughs> for a long time. I love the idea of a room where you can boud, you know, where you can just be in your mood, and it's a very pretty room, and it has a special little sofa and pretty furniture and whatnot, you know, a, a little carpet and I love I love that idea that you have your own little room where you could just be like it's like the equivalent of a man cave, but for a woman. Yeah. And you decorate and, and, it, right? Right? It's like going and, when you and Bood yeah. Bood is I love that well Bood the word is so fun. And for people who don't know it, it's it's almost like pouting or like glowering. It's like being in your mood. <laughs> I love that. I never thought about a boudoir as being a place where you can boud. It's a pouting room, exactly. <laughs> and you make it very beautiful and you pout. Because <laughs> life Why is would like you not that. Be- <laughs> Why wouldn't you want to be in a beautiful room to pout? <laughs> oh, it's wonderful. Oh, man. I love that. <laughs> Amazing. Well, Anne, where can our listeners find you on the internet or in real life? Oh, let's see. I'm, I'm on Instagram. Um, Instagram is probably the place. Instagram. And then I have my website too, annmarcella.com. Yeah. Amazing. And are you still hoping to host your salons moving forward? Oh, that would be wonderful. You know, it really sort of shut down, um, particularly even before COVID, but with COVID that really put a damper on it. <laughs> but mm-hmm. but um, I'm hoping to, I'm hoping to, you know, when you get a little bit, we'll see how things uh, transpire. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So listeners keep following Anne and hopefully she'll bring back her amazing salons filled with dance and amazing conversation and beautiful people, men, women, and other all milling about and being fabulous together. Thank you, Emily. Maybe we'll see some of you there. Thank you so much. Thank you. Take care. You too. Bye. This has been Navigating the French. You can find more from me, Emily Monaco, at Emily underscore in underscore France on Twitter and Instagram. This podcast is produced by Paris Underground Radio. To listen to other episodes of this podcast or to discover more podcasts like it, please visit parisundergroundradio.com. Thanks for listening and à bientôt.